With that, I'm going to uh, say a prayer and we'll jump into our passage. We're going to be in Acts chapter 9 today. Well, Father, we are so grateful to be here together as a group and to be able to gather uh, in your name on this gorgeous summer morning. And we just want to take this meeting and offer it up to you, ask that you would uh, do what you have in mind with it, that you would um, speak to each one of us, that you would lead us. We're here because we want to learn about you and we want to uh, we want to say yes to your invitation to follow you. We want to be drawn near to you. And I pray that you do that for each person this morning, that you would, you would draw us a little bit closer to you, uh, help us to see a little bit more clearly who you are so that we can uh, live that out in our lives. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so our series that we've been doing, Jesus One-on-One, is a series that's sort of picking and choosing instances in the New Testament where Jesus has a one-on-one interaction with another person. There's tons of material about Jesus in the Bible, but, uh, and of all different sorts. But, but one sort is where Jesus sort of has these asides or these intimate moments with individuals. And I think that we can learn something kind of special from those. There's some kind of, I don't know, insight or something that comes out when you have uh, God incarnate, God put on flesh, interacting with an ordinary person and the things that we can see. And so we've been reading the accounts and then asking three questions. What does this teach us about God or Jesus? What does it teach us about salvation? Because that's Jesus' mission, is to rescue the human race. And what does it teach us about ourselves? Because when when we interact with God, uh, we learn about ourselves. Sometimes very profound things, sometimes uncomfortable things. But uh, we got a good one today. I might be stretching the definition of a one-on-one with this one a little bit, but it's probably okay. Um, Most of these that we've studied have taken place in the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because those chronicle Jesus' life and ministry and death and resurrection. Acts is later. Acts, by Acts chapter 9, you know, Jesus has already resurrected. He's already ascended to heaven, and we're reading about the church at this point and, uh, and how the church was growing across the ancient world. And so to get, to get our, our hands on this passage, we actually have to start in 7 because that kind of sets things up. Basically, this Christian movement has been really exploding in Jerusalem, And uh, they're beginning to experience a headwind of persecution. So this has kind of been like a theme in Acts, this persecution ratcheting up, a little more intense, a little more intense. They're getting confronted. They're getting put on trial. They're getting locked up. They're getting beaten. And then it comes to a head in chapter 7 when this guy Stephen is dragged before the Sanhedrin on false charges. And there's this long exchange where he makes his defense. He is innocent of the charges they're bringing, but they can't defeat him in an argument, and they get so angry that in an impulse, they decide to stone Stephen to death, which is the first Christian death, the first martyr in the name of Christ in this segment of history. And so it says in verse 57, but they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. So, so they murder Stephen. They, they beat him to death with stones, which would be horrific to, to witness, to see. And then our author includes this weird little detail where he says they laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. When you stone someone, you remove your, your outer garment. You know, you had, you had your undergarments, and then they had their outer garment, which was finery. And so if you're going to do anything athletic, like I guess stoning someone counts as athleticism, then you, you remove that. And it says that they lay them aside at the feet of this young man named Saul. And it's like, who cares who guarded the cloaks, Right? It's a weird chapter because the whole cha- there's all these characters in the chapter and only two of them are named by name, Stephen 
and Saul, the guy who guarded the cloaks. It, it either means that he's very important to this stoning that was happening, like he's responsible, it could mean, or it also could just mean that he, it's not so much that he's important to the stoning of Stephen, but that he's important to the book of Acts, which he definitely is. What's happening here is Luke is introducing a primary character in kind of a cinematic way. Here's this, in, this turning point moment, and you know who was there? Saul. Don't forget that name. It's foreshadowing. So you read the next verse, and it says, Now Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And listen to that language. You know, hearty agreement. Think about, seriously, imagine witnessing someone stoned in a pit. Can you imagine how horrible that would be? And can you imagine the state of mind you'd have to be in to be like, yes, amen. Hearty agreement. I'm going to go on Facebook tonight, and I'm going to be like, I witnessed a stoning today. Thumbs up. It was great. He's like cheering on the violent death of this innocent guy. And it, and it, it raises this question, which is like, okay, so who is this character? Ben just told me that Luke, the author, is introducing basically the bad guy of the book. Here's the bad guy. So who is this bad guy? Who is the bad guy of the book of Acts? Well, we actually know quite a bit about him because he writes about himself elsewhere in the Scriptures we have recorded. So, for example, later on in Acts 22, here's Saul speaking about himself. He says, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God just as you are all today. Now, that might not sound like very impressive to you, but in the ancient world, he, this is a description of an elite social pedigree that this guy comes from. First of all, he says, I'm a Jew, which among Jews really mattered. He, he's not a Roman. He's not a, he's not a proselyte. He's not one of those icky Samaritans that they despised. He's a proper Jew, but born in Tarsus which is more of a prominent Gentile city. So he comes, he comes from kind of a big deal uh, place on the Gentile side of things, a wealthy family in an important city. He's a Roman citizen, which was very rare and a sought-after credential. It was a big deal to be a Roman citizen. Most of the, uh, most of the officials in Jerusalem were not Roman citizens. Saul was. So he's a big deal on the Gentile side of things, but he's a Jew, and he was brought up in Jerusalem. So you see, he kind of has both of, both of these credentials that would please both sides. Educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers. Gamaliel was like the top teacher of the day in the Sanhedrin. He, he's a great-grandson of Rabbi Hillel. People still study Gamaliel today. And Saul is his is his disciple. Saul is his protege. So, so you don't get that by being a nobody. Like The point I'm trying to get across here is he's a big deal. He is an influential, big deal. He has an elite social pedigree and an elite religious pedigree. He is sort of a standout rising star, a young man, it says, and yet he's there among the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin with some sort of clout and authority. It's a big deal. Here he is writing in Philippians 3, 4. He says, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. So that's like, you know, if you want to talk about worldly, you know, if you want to compete, who, who's got reason to be more confident, I'll take anybody on. You know, you want to talk about credentials and, and who knows the biggest names and can drop them, that's me. He says, and he starts listing them off. Circumcised on the eighth day. That's when you're supposed to get circumcised. That's the, I've been keeping the law since literally the first law there is for me to follow. Eight days in, I've been following the law. <laughs> Nation of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. A lot of Jews by this point in history didn't know their ancestral tribe. He knows. It's Benjamin. As to the law of Pharisee, as to righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. 
Pharisees were this sort of top of the food chain, very elite, very strict in their law keeping, very focused on the details and the commands, they, they very focused on righteous behavior, especially in the minutia. You know, they would have memorized large portions of the Torah, maybe the whole thing. And they would have exacting debates about how to apply that to you. And it was very important because they were keeping this better than anybody. That's who he is. And therefore, he says as to zeal, you want to talk about my passion. Where's my fire burn? Persecution of the church. He hated Christians and the Christian movement. And I think it makes sense when you think about from his background, he's a big deal. And so when this kind of new movement, this upstart movement based on this shabby, homeless carpenter from Galilee, and they're out there telling people, you know, it doesn't matter about your, your heritage. It doesn't matter about your bloodline. It doesn't matter about how, you know, don't, don't worry about keeping the details of the law. It's more about matters of the heart and faith. You see why that would be a total threat to a guy like Saul? Because it means that anybody, including disgusting sinners, could have equal standing before God. And that will not do, because that undermines his whole way of thinking. And so he was disgusted by the church and zealously hated it. And so, yeah, he's in hearty agreement. He is slow clapping the death of Stephen. It says, and on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. So this is an important tipping point here. The, the pressure has been rising, but on that moment, there, what we have is now an outbreak of violence. People realize if the Sanhedrin can kill a prominent Christian, that means it's open season on Christians. And it says they were all scattered. People, it became unsafe. It was not safe to be a Christian in Jerusalem after this point. They had to leave the city, pick up, leave their families, scatter out throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. It says some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. I think Luke is using really emphatic language. Look, like, look at this language. They're barging in. They're, they're entering people's houses. They're dragging people off. They're locking them up in prison. He emphasizes it's men and women, which I think speaks to the intensity, the ferocity of this persecution. It's not, you know, not just men who they normally sort of held responsible for the household. It's anyone. It's anyone who aligns themselves with Christ. Imagine being in a, in, a, in a little study in your home and having a, a, a mob barge in and drag people off. That's what's happening. Terrifying. And, and who is doing this? Who is, who is perpetrating this? I think it's kind of interesting. Because what does it say? It says Saul was ravaging the church. I'm sure it wasn't just Saul right? I'm sure it's the council. I'm sure it's, you know, but it doesn't say the high priest. It doesn't say roving gangs or mobs of angry people, although I'm sure it was those things. It says Saul. It lays this whole thing at his feet that Saul is the driving force. He is the personification of the persecution. He is taking his stand against the gospel. Acts chapter 8 is basically about how successful he is. Christians are scattered out to Judea and Samaria. And so by the time you get to chapter 9, you're expecting him to be sort of exalting in his success. But when it circles back around to Saul, look what it says. It says, now Saul, just chapter 9 verse 1, now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So even though he has won, he's still like, what's the word? He's like seething, right? He's, he's, have you ever breathed threats and murder? You have. I just brought some terrible memory into your mind. You know, like when you're, when you're sitting there and like, you're like, I, if, if I breathe out 
words are inappropriate words are going to come. I can't exhale without shaping it into rage. He hates them, even though he has defeated them. And what's he want to do? He wants to go up to Damascus. Understand, this is way up north. This is where Christians have fled. He has successfully uh, dislodged them from their home, but that's not enough. He wants to go after them all the way up there. He wants authority from the high priest to go up there and, and demand that those synagogues cough up their Christians so that he can bind them up and bring them back. It's a six-day journey to Damascus. He wants to bind them physically and bring them back to Jerusalem. And you're reading this and you're like, what is with this guy? You know, like how much is enough? He is brilliant, he is influential, he is aggressive, and he is relentless. This menacing figure, he, and he will not stop. He's like the Terminator, right? <laughs> he has locked onto his target and, and nothing will stop him. And so it kind of builds up drama. When you read through the book of Acts, you start to get this like, something's, something's going to happen here. Because in the, in the book of Acts, people who take you know, their stand against God, God deals with his enemies pretty decisively in Acts. And here, this guy has picked up the flag and drawn a line in the sand and been like, I, I saw stand against this gospel. I stand against Jesus Christ. I de- he is defying the God of heaven. And so you're reading this, and you're like, what is going to happen? I mean, there's going to be a showdown. And it is not going to go well for Saul. Well, it says, as he was traveling up to Damascus, as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul... Saul, why are you persecuting me? A light. Another account tells us that this happened in broad daylight. So a blinding light in broad daylight. You know, in the ancient world, they didn't have floodlights or helicopters. They didn't have, you know... Like a flashlight would have been kind of amazing. So the idea that a, a blinding light, like what would that be? And, and notice it says that it caused him to fall to the ground. So don't get in your mind that he like, this wasn't like an interesting thing he observed. You know, he wasn't like, oh, hark, in the sky, I see a distant light. No, it was like, wah, and he fell down. I mean, have you ever, honestly, have you ever had a sensory experience that caused you to fall down? Like something that was so overwhelming. I was thinking about this, and I have only one time had this happen, where I sensed something so powerfully that I fell down. And it was when I was about, I don't know, probably 12 years old, and I got caught in a thunderstorm. Uh, and, I, and I got absolutely drenched, and I was walking home from somewhere, and so I, I had given up even trying to stay dry because I was already so wet, and so I just said, forget it, I'm going to walk right in the middle of the street. And so I was just walking down the middle of the street, just a few houses from my house, and this lightning bolt struck a pole that was, that was not farther than this back wall from where I am. I mean, it was like right there. I felt it, and I remember it was like, ah! and the transformer exploded, and the, the pole was on fire. Now, I don't know how you would respond in that situation, and I, I don't know how I thought that I would have responded. I think I thought I would have done something kind of admirable. You know, like you imagine... That, like maybe your instinct would be to like shield someone else or, or at least strike a superhero, you know, like, oh, bright light. But that's not what I did. What I did, I don't actually know for sure what I did, but I know that when it was over, I was looking at that pole on fire and I realized that my, I was standing crouched down like this with my legs together and I was grabbing the sides of my pants <laughs> And I was screaming. (laughs) 
And I know that that's true because I, then I sprinted home and my sister, who had seen the whole thing in the window, was just rolling on the floor laughing. <laughs> it takes a lot to make you fall down. Okay? He falls down. And it says that he heard a voice. Now Saul is a Bible scholar. He's, he knows the book of Daniel. He knows what it means when a light from heaven and a voice confronts you. He understands. It's not, this is not a UFO abduction. This is a confrontation from heaven by an angel, at least. And the voice asks a question. Why are you persecuting me? That's a, that's a rough question. We've said before in here that when God asks questions, it's usually not because he's curious or, or wondering. It's that he's, he is holding up the mirror. He wants us to grapple with something. This is a question for Saul. Why are you persecuting me? And how do you answer that, you know? I am. Saul said, who are you, Lord? Don't say Jesus. He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. <laughs> so, it's sad because you know that he did not think of himself as work. He thought of himself as zealous for God. And in this moment, he's realizing something very profound, which is that he's totally wrong. And so here's our one-on-one -on -one for today, <laughs> Jesus and Saul. It's very short. <laughs> Jesus and Saul on the road. One thing I want to point out while we're here is what Jesus says. He says, I am Jesus, and he doesn't say, I am Jesus, Lord of Stephen, whom you persecute. He doesn't say, I am Jesus, and you are persecuting my people. He says, I am Jesus, and you are persecuting me. And I think that tells us something pretty important about how Jesus views the church, that, that we're not just his associates, but that, but that we are an extension of him, the body of Christ, his agency in this world. He says, they are carrying out my mission in my name, and when you ravage them, Saul, you ravage me. And then God struck Saul with lightning. And Saul exploded in a multitude of tiny pieces, and there was great rejoicing throughout all Judea. So that's the end. No, that's, that's not actually verse 6. I just made that up. But I think, I think it's worth, it, it, it kind of feels like it's going that way. You know, to the ancient reader, think about, if you defied a king in the ancient world, what do you expect? If, if you defy the Greek gods, they come up with these incredibly, incredible ways to torture people, you know? So what does it mean if I've taken my stand against the living God and then he confronts me and he's like, you are persecuting me. I think that the reader braces for the fiery death of Saul and probably Saul did too. Here's the real verse 6. Saul, why are you persecuting me? But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. So he has this entourage with him. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So three days, he can't see. Three days to absorb the consequences of what has just happened. Three days to rethink your whole life, really. And I think it's interesting that it says he didn't eat or drink. I'm sure that they would have supplied food and drink to a prisoner. I think that what's happening here, I think he's fasting. I think, he's, I think that he is morning. You know, I don't know, I don't know for sure what was going on in his mind, but I like to, to imagine 
Because think about this guy, you know, he had heard all this stuff before. He had heard the arguments about Jesus. He knew about the, the miracles. He had just listened to Stephen lay out Old Testament verse after verse after verse, arguing for Jesus as the Messiah, and he knew all those verses. He had met and argued with the eyewitnesses. And yet, through all of that, he had held his ground against Jesus. And now, he has incontrovertible proof that he's totally wrong. So, I don't know. I I like to think of it as, I bet that it was a sequence kind of like, you know, if if that was the risen Christ, then that means... If that was Jesus, then that means that he indeed has risen from the dead, as they claim. And if that is true, then that means that he is indeed the Messiah. Which means that my whole way of understanding the scriptures that I love so much is wrong and that they are right. And I bet he was just going back through all those verses in Isaiah, in the Psalms, the things that Moses foreshadowed and predicted, oh my God, they're all right. And that means that my whole way of life, my whole religious worldview about, you know, your background and the hierarchy and and earning your way with, with righteous good deeds and being better than you at the law, that's all wrong. And that means that my colleagues who I learn from, who look up to me, are fools, which makes me chief fool among them, the most zealous fool. And it means that those people that I killed were innocent, which makes me a murderer. And it means that those people were, in fact, God's people, which makes me an enemy of God. I'm totally going to hell. And then another question, why didn't why did he spare me? What now? Why didn't he take me out? God's taken people out for less. Now, it says there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. So now we're in this city where Saul was going and we meet a new character, a disciple, a follower of Jesus who's there in Damascus. This would have been one of the people that Saul was aiming to attack and bring back to Jerusalem. This is the target. And Jesus now appears to Ananias. It says, The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And he said, And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying. Oh, one more bit of insight into what Saul was doing. He's praying. What is, his, what is Saul's instinct in his, in his total wrongness? He prays. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. He's expecting you to come, and I promise to give him his sight back. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. He's like, God, do you know who that is? That's Saul of Tarsus. He is, that dude's a killer. Like he's, you want me to go talk to him? Is he going to like bind me up and drag me to Jerusalem? Do you want me to kill him? Is that what this is? (laughs) Like, you want me to go talk to Saul for what? But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Okay, what, what what is Jesus doing here? This is a confusing passage because it's almost like he is giving to Saul. Do you see this? He spares him on the road. He, gives, he says, come in, I have a place for you. He, he appears to Saul and says, I'm sending someone to give you your sight back. And then he goes and persuades Ananias, what is happening here? And what it is is that we're bumping up against one of the really, I think, hard 
to understand and also mind-blowing things about God. One of the ways that he is totally different from you and I, which is that God loves his enemies. God does not look at his enemies the same way that you and I do. He deals with his enemies, but when he he looks at his enemies, he sees lost sons and daughters. I don't know what all Saul was thinking about, but I bet one thing he was thinking about was that episode where they stoned Stephen, where he held the coats. And you know what Stephen said as they stoned him to death? It's pretty remarkable. Acts 7, 59, they went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then, falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Stephen, asking God for mercy as they killed, praying for his murderers as he went. Now, I I mean, I have no idea what Saul would have thought about that when he heard it at the time, but what must he think about it now, knowing that that was God's man? Don't hold this sin against me. He totally should hold this sin against me. What does it mean that he doesn't? What we're seeing here is God's mercy. When we deserve something bad and God spares us from it, that's called mercy. But then when God, on top of that, layers upon blessings, not only sparing us from the negative consequences we do deserve, but but blessing us undeserved on top of that, that's called grace. And that is the semi-impossible-to-get-your-mind-around feature of God, that He loves people who do not deserve love. He loves people as they breathe threats and murder against Him. That's God's grace. And we've seen it play out in this passage. He confronted, he didn't even need to confront Saul. He could have just bumped him off. He could have just given him like a terrible, you know, gastrointestinal disease, nice little quiet, painful death. He didn't do that. He confronted him. You're wrong. And he did that knowing that he had already paid the guilt of his sin. This is the thing to understand, this whole message that Saul is persecuting. What's he doing? He's trying to stop the gospel message. But do you know what the gospel says? Do you know what the gospel is? Jesus said it right here in Luke 24, commissioning his disciples. He said, thus it's written that the Christ, Jesus, would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. The message that he proclaims is the message of forgiveness of sins. Such irony that Saul is trying to clamp this down. No, do not tell people their sins are forgiven. And God's like, what about your sins, Saul? But I've already forgiven it. Because what Jesus Christ did on the cross was to stand in our place and pay for every sin, each one of us, past, present, and future. And so the gospel is an announcement that the Messiah has come and paid for sins and also an invitation to come and join him. That's what repentance means, means to change your mind. The gospel is right there in that sentence, repentance for forgiveness of sins. That's the deal that God's offering. I am ready to forgive and accept you completely. All I need is for you to change your mind about me. So the invitation for Saul to change his mind, to be completely forgiven, to receive the Holy Spirit, and to live eternally in the unconditional love of his Father in heaven. And I don't want anybody to walk out of here today and not understand that this is the same invitation that stands for each and every person everywhere in the world. That God says, let me pay your way. I want you, I want to be reconciled to you. And I don't care if we're only a little bit enemies or a lot enemies. I've taken care of it. But your part is to turn and say, yeah, I need my sins forgiven. And Grace upon grace, God has a plan to redeem Saul's entire life. Like, what does he say to Ananias? Ananias is like, I don't think I should go talk to him. And he's like, no, you should go because he is a chosen instrument of mine. I have chosen, I have a job for him. And I, you know, a lot of times in the Bible when people change their mind about God, there's a process of, 
you know, evidence and, and something that happens in the heart. What's interesting about this passage is the emphasis is much more on God's part in the choosing. He's like, I call him. That, guy, that Terminator, I, he's mine. And uh, I think that that's interesting because he has, he has this role for him. And I'm sure that, you know, the angels were like, wait, you choose that guy? Yeah, he's going to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. This guy's going to be my voice piece to both Jews and Gentiles. For I will show him how much he must suffer. You know, what's interesting here is, I think what's happening is that he's casting a vision. He, he's saying, he's not just saying what he wants to do, he's, he's giving a, a prediction. I have a plan for this man's life. And yeah, I know. I know who he is. And I know what he's done. And yet, I, all of those things about him, his brilliance, his training, all of this forces he has arrayed against me, I'm going to use all those in my name to accomplish my will. What does this 16 mean? Because 16 is kind of troubling, isn't it? For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. It sounds kind of vindictive. You know, oh, don't worry about him. He's going to get his. I'm going to give him the worst duty in my whole kingdom, and he'll have to do laps. Um, is that what it means? I don't think it does mean that. And I don't think that it could mean that, actually, because that would mean that Jesus' death on the cross was not sufficient for Saul, and that he had to do makeup work on top of what Jesus did. I don't think it can mean that. I actually think he's saying something very positive here, even though it sounds negative to our ears. I will show him how much he will suffer for what? For, for defying me? I'll show him how much he must suffer my retribution for his sin? That's not what it says. I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And suffering on behalf of the name of Jesus Christ in Acts is, is the highest honor that anyone could have. When the disciples were flogged, what did they say? It says they went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. Same exact wording. What, what Jesus is saying here is he's saying, I have a plan for him and he will see that he's going to be numbered among my apostles. He's going to join us in the trenches just like you guys have. He's going to have the honor of suffering alongside us for the most noble cause in the universe. He was my enemy, but he will be my ally. Sharing in my work and in my glory, he will have the honor of suffering alongside me. This is a, this is a prophetic vision. It's not just a statement of intent. God's like, let me tell you what's going to happen with this guy. And that is exactly what happened with Saul. Saul. Saul goes on to be an instrument in God's hand. Saul is the guy that we also call Paul, who wrote half of the New Testament, who spent his life announcing Jesus to Jews, to Gentiles, to the kings, standing before kings, suffering, ironically, you know, now it's going to be Saul who is told to shut up and chased out of towns and stoned himself and eventually killed in the name of Jesus. It's all true. And you know what? He doesn't view it as punitive. When you read Paul later in his life, he acknowledges this. He said, remember this passage I read before? If anyone has confidence in the flesh, I far more. Look what he says next. He says, but whatever things were gained to me, all that comfort and credentials and power that I had, those things I have counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. I lost all of that. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. I traded everything I had for knowing Jesus, and it was worth it. My Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count those things but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, that's His old way of life, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, repentance for forgiveness of sins. 
that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I know the God of creation and the fellowship of his sufferings. He views it as, I have the privilege of fellowship with Jesus in his sufferings. So God had all that in store before Saul had any inkling. Well, it says Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at Ananias' faith, right? He goes, touches the Terminator, calls him brother. He's already take, he's like, God, if that's what Jesus says, and that's what's up. You're my brother. And that you're ready to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from Saul's eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight. And he got up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. That's how repentance works. He didn't get up and do penance and run laps, and apologize over and over, or beat himself with a whip. He got up, he got washed, he had a meal. He's ready to go. He deserved instant fiery death, and instead, he got rescued. He got the Holy Spirit and eternal life and a vision based on the hope of eternity with Jesus to be used right now in this life in important ways. That is, that is grace. And, and grace is the thing that changes people. If you wonder why Christians are so zealous and intent and on following Christ, or what, you know, what, why are they so motivated? It's because of this. It's because the understanding that I've been loved by God in a way that I don't deserve beyond what I can even comprehend. That is the the mystery that transforms. When you get a hold of this idea that God has gracious love toward you, it will change, it, it will change your life. And it certainly changed Saul's. It says, Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. I bet that was a trip right? He comes out and he's like, Jesus is the Son of God. (laughs) What? And all those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, is this not the one who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound for the chief priests? Isn't this the same guy? So God's able to overcome obstacles. It says, but Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. It, it, it means proving in the sense of like a scriptural debate. He's con- they're like, no, 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 that, he's not the son of God. Let's get out the scriptures. And Saul's like, oh, okay, I was made for this. Yes, let's get out the scriptures. And they cannot defeat him. He's confounding them, proving an argument. This is a complete reversal. God's like, now I have a Terminator. (laughs) And it says, when many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him, but their plot became known to Saul. Look how fast that happened. They're like, we have to kill him. He is too dangerous, and now it is Saul who's on the side of persecution. They, They were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. They're trying to lay a trap for him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. It's like an infiltrator. But Barnabas vouched for him. Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus and he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. Wow, what a, what a, what a crazy chapter. 
So, what does this teach us about God? I think it teaches us that His mercy and His grace is nothing short of scandalous. If you can't see the scandal here, this is shocking. You know, we're like, yeah, yeah, I know. Saul turns into Paul. I've heard this before. But they didn't know that was going to happen. The, the worst enemy. And it showed us how God loves His enemies. I think that this passage actually challenges in a pretty serious way how we think of enemies. Our culture is obsessed with enemies in, in all areas of life, in all, fa- in all departments of our life. Sociologists have been observing this trend that we have just gotten really into factioning and us versus them and you versus me and you're my enemy. And here comes God who legitimately does have enemies and is like, yeah, but I don't deal with them like you do. That's shocking and challenging. What does it teach us about salvation? Well, it teaches us that no one is too much of an enemy to be accepted by God. And that's good news because theologically, according to the Bible, we all stand as enemies of the cross. Romans 5.10, written by Paul, for while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. It means that his invitation stands today for each and every person. And finally, what does it teach us about ourselves? Well, there is something pretty humbling in this passage. You know, Saul meant well, and Saul was smarter than probably you or I, and, and better educated, and passionate in the name of God, and he was also totally wrong. Sometimes our passions, even our spiritual ones, can get misplaced, and we need to be humble. We need to be willing to receive correction from Jesus because we can get off on a tear in the wrong direction pretty easily. God has a purposeful plan for each one of our lives, and it might be a lot different than your plan. And I'm speaking here to followers of Christ, and I'm also speaking here to people who have never met Christ. But I'm sure you have a vision and a plan for your life, just like Saul. But but time and again, Christians that I talk to say, you know, I was headed one direction, I had all these resources and skills and experience that I was going to use for X, and then Jesus Christ grabbed me and said, actually, that's all from my kingdom. And it was the best thing that ever happened. We need to have a category for God pulling giant reversals in our life. So, that's what I've got there on uh, Saul and Jesus.